to go ahead and get started. We're still waiting for our third speaker. We hope he's, he will be here. Um, however, we have two speakers here, so we don't want to make them wait. Uh, I am Mark Hall Patton. I want to welcome you to this, uh, this edition, we might say, of Henderson Speaks. We have a great talk here tonight. Um, there are a few sort of housekeeping details I want to talk to you about. Uh, one, if you have a question at any point in the conversation, please hold the questions till the end. But to make it easier, just raise your hand and Bob or his lovely wife will give you a card. You can write it down. They'll take it and bring those up and we will go through the questions at the end. We want each of our speakers to have their whole time of speaking. So just raise your hand at any point and they'll get you a card. So be sure and do that. We want to thank our Henderson Historical Society sponsors. Those include the Landwell Company, Dignity Health, the City of Henderson, uh, the Emerald Island Casino, the Henderson Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Kasner Family Foundation. I don't know who controls that. Uh, I'm sure we'd find out if we asked. Uh, the Meadows Bank and Tronics Incorporated. Now, if you are a student here and you are coming here and hoping to get credit for being here tonight, be sure you signed in or sign before you left or leave. Because if you're not on the sign in sheet, you're not here. Even though you are, we know you're here, we see you, but it won't count. So be sure that you sign in because the, the, that will be going to your professors. So don't, don't want you to lose out on that. Um, want to recognize a um, couple of people that have joined us here from the City of Henderson Sports Department. Uh, J.D. Green, where are you, J.D.? Oh, there you are, right back there. And then sitting two down from him is James DiNicola. Uh, these guys both work for the Sports Department for the City of Henderson. They have information with them, please see them. They have brochures on their adult sports offerings. They also have a uh, sports expo coming up on October 7th. So be sure and pick up some brochures and you can talk to them about all the offerings that the city of Henderson has now. Something a little bit different than perhaps in the earlier days in some of our history here, a lot of cities didn't offer uh, sports that was something that you got in the schools instead. Uh, or solely, I shouldn't, shouldn't say instead. Uh, but first, I want to invite Lou to come up. Lou Laporta is going to say a few words. He is the president and founder of the Historical Society and has done everything. So I'm going to turn it over to Lou here. Do you hear me? Wonderful. Well, let me introduce myself. I am Lou Laporta with the uh, Henderson Historical Society, and I welcome each one of you tonight. You know, the Historical Society started about seven years ago, and we have been very, very pleased to see what we have in the way of audiences. Everybody wants to hear something about the city of Henderson. It goes back a long way, 75 years ago, but I'm not going to be talking about how long we have been in the historical society of it. One of the things I'm going to mention to you is that uh, Henderson depended upon the athletes that we had at Basic High. And I want to re remember now a fellow by the name of uh, uh, oh, Estes McDaniel. Did anybody ever hear about Estes McDaniel? Good. He was a mayor, by the way, but he was also a coach. And I had an office on Water Street back in the 50s, and I would hear his voice, and he was three blocks away. <laughs> and honest to God, he had those football players really, really playing. Now, the football field was where the city hall is 
that's it. But I'm not going to talk much more about it because I think we have some interesting speakers this evening, the athletes that we've known. And uh, so at this moment, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark. Mark is with the, uh, I, I should say, with the Clark County Museum, and we put him to work constantly. Mark? Thanks, Lou. There we go. We don't want the microphones competing with each other. That's a bad idea. So, and, and by the way, I was told that we don't like mentioning birthdays, so we are not going to mention that it's Mary George's birthday today. Okay? <laughs> I want you to know that I'm not going to do that. That would be, that would be wrong. But she is volunteering tonight. So, sorry about that. <laughs> So we're going to start out with Judy Cameron. She is from Missouri, attended college in Iowa, uh, moved to Clark County in the 1960s and was hired at Basic High School in 1968, according to my notes. Am I correct on that? Correct. Good. All right. Got something right to begin with. It works. Uh, was in charge of GAA in 68 at, at Basic High School. Uh, one of her pupils was Renee Brown, who uh, went on to do quite a bit in a lot of different areas, not to mention being uh, with the uh, WNBA from, for the first 20 years of its existence. She only stepped down last year, I think it was. Uh, she worked with Robert Lunt and, and um, Norman Kraft uh, to provide expanded opportunities for female players uh, allowing for them to also receive athletic scholarships, not something that wasn't always available, and eventually became the principal of Bonanza High School. And it should be noted that the stadium there is named for her. So, you know, she has a name on the land as well. So, I just wanted to start out um, to say, did you work at both of the basic high school campuses, the, the one on... on uh, the old one, yeah, the second, second of three. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, how were they different? How did, how did they? Only worked at the one. Oh, okay. So you I worked at the the current one. I, I no, I worked at the one before on Ben Wagner. Ah, okay. And what was that like? It was great. It was great. It was a it was a good school. It was a well run school. Uh, John Dooley was the principal when I was there, when I first went there. And uh, all the teachers would go to the, uh, the meetings that Mr. Dooley would, would hold. And we would all rush to the back of the room to see if we could get back. Because he was very emotional. And he always cried during some time of the meeting. Uh, Estes McDaniel was an assistant principal at the time. Oh, yeah. So, were you able to hear the beginning there? Probably not. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'd like to start back further than that. I, I went to uh, Nevada kind of on a lark. I, I graduated in 1963 from Iowa Wesleyan College in Mount Pleasant, Iowa and had been very, very fortunate to be involved in the basketball program there at the college at that time, which was very unusual. Um, but when I decided to, to look for places to teach, something came from Las Vegas, and it, it looked pretty good because the salary was great. $5,280. <laughs> and that looked good to me, but I was also very interested in going to Colorado. And uh, I had almost decided, made up my mind to go to the Denver area. And I got a call from a gentleman that I don't know if any of you might remember, but his name was, uh, uh, let me think, Doc Woodbury. And he was in charge of personnel in the Clark County School District. And Rick asked me earlier if I'd say something about my interview 
with, with the Clark County School District. And it went kind of like this. Uh, I had sent all my paperwork in. I had not responded to a contract that had been sent to me. Doc Woodbury called me and he said, Judy, what, why are you hesitant about coming out here? The sun is shining, the sky is blue, the roses are in bloom, and you need to sign that contract. <laughs> that was my interview. Uh, and I did sign the contract. I came out here in, in the summer of 1963, late summer, right before school started, and he had neglected to tell me that it was 115 degrees. <laughs> I had not been to Las Vegas before, and uh, as a young teacher, I was at J.D. Smith Junior High School. I got involved with a couple of associations, a uh, physical education association, and an association called the National Girls of Women in Sport. And those were, those were national associations, they had local, uh, meetings all over the country, and through that, I met two women. Uh, one was with the Las Vegas Recreation Department down on Dulles Center, and the other one was a teacher at Basic High School. And they were trying at that time in 1963 to organize some participation for young women at junior high and high school age uh, to participate in league play at the recreation department because there was nothing organized in any of the schools that allowed them to participate against other schools. Uh, high schools had GAA, which someone asked me about when I was coming in, and that was a girls athletic association, and you could do all kinds of things you wanted to do at your own school, but you didn't go anywhere else and play. And if you were lucky, occasionally you would be allowed to have a play day, one day where you could invite other schools to come in and participate maybe in a volleyball tournament or basketball tournament, something like that. But that's all that was available. But there were these two ladies, and they were pretty much feminists in an early time. Uh, they were very persistent about what they wanted to do, and, and they kept pushing that and pushing that. And they got a league established at the rec department. The lady's name was Joyce Coleman. She was the director at uh, the Recreation Center. Uh, the lady's name at Basic High School was Barbara Tyson. Some of you long ago may remember Barbara Tyson. And as I said, Barbara, Barbara was a, a pushy person. If she wanted something done, she was going to push and push and push until it happened. And because of those two ladies, something very good started here in Las Vegas. And I would also mention one other thing. There was a gentleman who was in charge of the Henderson Parks and Recreation whose name was Dundee Jones. And those of you who've been around for a while remember that name. He was a, a wonderful guy with a great vision, and he, he knew that recreation departments were for everybody. And there, were, there was no limit to whether it was or, or the guys or the girls, the boys. It didn't make any difference. He would support any program that you had going. And he was supportive of the program that went on at Doula Center. He was also supportive of practice times for girls at Basic High School and at the junior high school here who wanted to practice before they went to play. Because it was very hard to get into a high school gym or a junior high gym because we just weren't allowed the time there. Uh, when everybody else was out, uh, the basketball players, the wrestling coaches, the dance team, uh, the cheerleaders, whomever they were, then you could have some time. And so our times for those young ladies was at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night on a Saturday, and that's when the gym could be used. We were fortunate at BASIC in that the administration there said, you know, this is a good program. We like what you're doing. You know, it's good for basic high school. There are good things happening with it. We're going to let you do it as long as you don't bother us. And that's pretty much how it went. Uh, we stayed out of everybody's way, and we did our own thing. There were a group of women in town who were coaching these teams who had experience uh, only through AAU competition when they were in college because that was the only venue at that time at the college level that was available. 
and we were all involved in that. So our athletic background came from that. And, and there was a handful, I would say, of about eight committed women coaches at the junior and senior high level at that time. Now remember, there weren't very many schools. So that number is not particularly indicative of, of what you would think of now with the number of high schools and junior highs we have. But those women were committed. Those programs were run for those girls because out of pocket money for t-shirts and we sewed numbers on or we marked them on with pencils. Uh, officials we paid for, league fees to enter down there we paid for. Uh, equipment was all ours, we paid for it out of our pocket. So all of those coaches that were there were very committed to what they were doing. Because if you remember, I said my starting salary was $5,280. Uh, that's not a lot of money for me to spend on something else. And uh, I think the commitment shown by those women was fantastic. And as a result of that, uh, I came to basic high school in 1968. Uh, Barbara Tyson had left the previous year. Uh, the programs that she was involved with, I continued. I was coaching basketball, volleyball, softball, track and field. Had junior varsity teams in both volleyball and basketball. And that's what was happening at Rancho High School with the individuals there. It was happening at Valley High School with the individuals there. We had a spot of a team from Western High School. Once in a while, somebody from Vegas High School. But that's what they were all doing. It wasn't just me by a long shot. But we were committed to that program and I will tell you that uh, during, from 68 to 71, you should be proud of this at Henderson. Uh, two county championships in volleyball were won by Basic High School. Three county championships in basketball were won by Basic High School. Three county championships in softball were run by Basic High School. And the track meet uh, was, run, was won by Basic High School for three years. Uh, that was a one-day track meet. It involved elementary schools in the district, junior high schools in the district, and senior high schools in the di district. Excuse me. I will also tell you that the competition at that time was primarily, I mean, the best of the best, Basic High School, Rancho High School, and Valley High School. And the competition was great. But what happened during that time was Bart Tyson, who had been here first, um, had gone to student activities in the, in the school district and had talked to Bob Lunt, who at that time was the director of student activities, and had pushed and pushed and pushed Mr. Lunt to get a program in the schools. He and Barb didn't really hit it off so well, uh, but he started paying attention to what was going on down at the rec center. And as a result of that, I think he figured out we were committed enough and spending enough of our own money that we weren't going to go away. And he contacted me and said, uh, Judy, I'd like to talk to you. Would you come out and tell me what you're doing with that program there? Uh, so we did that and talked a long time. Uh, as a result of that, me that meeting, we developed a steering committee of five women uh, who worked for a year to figure out the cost of implementing some kind of a program at the high school level in the Clark County School District. That was in 1969-1970. Uh, at the end of that year, uh, we met with a school board Things are a lot different now. You know, you sat down at a table round with the school board and talked about everything. And, you know, Helen Cannon was, was on the board at that time. Glenn Taylor, who's a Henderson person, uh, was on the board at that time. They had lots of questions for us like, well, I'm a little worried about these uniforms. They, they need to look right. Uh, we don't want those girls uh, bouncing around all over the floor when they're in their uniforms. So Mrs. Cannon was very very persuasive in that we be very careful about our selection of uniforms. Uh, she also said to me one day, because we were talking about putting a volleyball program in the gym, that was prime territory. 
gymnasiums. And for women to want to go in the gym for anything, that was tough. And she said, Judy, I don't understand why you can't play volleyball outside. And, and I thought for a minute, I thought, you know, I probably need to be a little careful here, but uh, I knew Mrs. Cannon was a golfer. And I said, Mrs. Cannon, Cannon, with all due respect, would you want to play golf inside? And she said, I think I get your point. Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, the result of that meeting was we implemented a program the next year uh, in 1970. And Bob Lunt, I can tell you, he was the director of student activities, an absolutely fantastic man. And I credit him with probably my whole career here because he changed uh, me and what I was doing in the Clark County School District the, the first day I went in and talked to him. He saw a vision, he said, you know, some things aren't right, some things are gonna happen down the road, we need to make some changes. And he was a very persuasive guy. And uh, we had a young superintendent at that time whose name was Kenny Gwynn. And, and Bob had a, had a good ear for Kenny and uh, he, he badgered and talked and convinced him that this was a good thing and we needed to take a step to move forward and, and put some girls athletics in the high school. And Kenny was a, pretty much a visionary, as most of you know, if you followed his career. And uh, he, he got on board and he said, we're going to do this. You know, we'll make it happen. And uh, so we went the first year with uh, softball, golf, and tennis. Now that isn't what we wanted, but we got something. And, and Bob came to me one day and he said, okay, Judy, next year I'd like you to kind of coordinate these programs while you're teaching at Basic High School. And I said, you know, something about that doesn't seem quite right to me. Um, I'm supposed to be teaching. You've had me out of my classroom almost a year already working on this steering committee. And now you want me to run this program and what's going to happen with the kids that I teach? And I was very concerned about that. And he said, well, you know, I, I, I can't offer you anything else. And I said, you know what? I was, I was feeling pretty good. We got a program. Uh, I said, you know what? Have fun. Take care of the program. And I walked away from it. Uh, for about six months, he called me. I left basic high school, too, when I did that. And about six months later, he called me and he said, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about maybe coming out here and uh, taking care of this program. Norm had had one experience of running a softball tournament with women, and Norm said, Norm Kraft, who was going to speak later, I hope, uh, he was in stu student activities with me, and Norm, and Norm said, Bob, call Judy. This is, I can't do this. You know, this is, this is too much. I can't do it. And he was coordinating the, the men's junior and senior high school program. So Bob called and said, what, do you, what is it going to take to get you out here? And I said, well, you need to pay me, you know, and uh, if you want me to come the rest of the year, I'll come out for, for the rest of the year half time. I didn't think they'd do that, but they did. And so I went to student activities, and I remember walking in the building that day, and we were located out behind the warehouse, and I had our own building back there. And I walked in and they were moving the Xerox machine. At that time it was a Xerox machine. They were moving it out of this room that was about as wide as I am from the wall to this table. And that was my desk. So I went in the Xerox room and uh, it, it was great. Uh, Norm Kraft is fantastic. He was great to work with as was Bob Lunt and certainly Kenny Gwynn. And what happened after I got out there was pretty interesting too because the start of the next school year I was on full time, uh, salaried on full time, and Bob had already started pushing me to become an administrator, which I wasn't interested in doing at that time. But uh, the program got off the ground from 1970 to 73 
we added uh, three more programs at the high school level, basketball, volleyball, and uh, mm, I have to stop and think what the other one was, track and field. We added three more programs. Uh, in two more years, we put in a full junior high program in all those sports. And this was before a, something called Title IX, which you all may have heard about. Title IX was passed by law in 1972. And I, I'm just going to read this to you real quickly. Uh, Title IX basically stated that no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation, be, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Well, immediately, this whole country went crazy. Oh my goodness, we've got to add girls sports in, in the colleges and the high schools and everything. There weren't any. But there was in the Clark County School District. We had gotten the jump on that. And as a result of that, the Clark County School District got a lot of publicity all over the country about the programs that were going on here and the women that were involved, the coaches that were involved here. And the state all of a sudden said, well, wait a minute. You guys are getting a lot of credit down there. And we don't want to do this. Well, you got to do it. It's law now. Uh, Mr. Lunt got me on the Nevada Interscholastic Activities Association board and told me, if you think you had it tough when you started down here, wait till this board gets hold of you. Uh, it, it wasn't pleasant, I, I will say this. I love everything that happened in the school district. I would not want anyone else to go through some of the things that the women coaches had to deal with with those programs putting in place. Uh, I remember going to the first athletic directors meeting at the high school and Bob told me before I went, he said, Judy, I'm going to tell you something right now. Nobody that you're going to see in that room wants you there. <laughs> I said, well, that's a lovely way to start the day, you know, but it was true. And uh, there, there was a lot of dissension. You know, we were going to come in. We were going to ask for space in the gym. We were going to get space in the gym. We were going to ask for equipment. We were going to get that. We were going to get a lot of things. And a lot of people just got scared. They said, you know, it won't work. It can't happen. Well, the problem was it could have happened a long time ago. But it hadn't, and it had been the way it was for so long that when you start to change people, you know, it's difficult, and, and it's fearful. And I think a lot of that, at least what I felt, and nobody really didn't like me or any of the women coaches, but they, they didn't know what to expect. And, and, and I give a lot of credit to a lot of men who came around fairly quickly. And, and two of them I'll mention because I, I ended up with them as coaches at Basic High School. Uh, Horace Smith who was a principal at Basic High School, and Rick Trosdale, who was Horace's, bu Horace's buddy, and he kind of followed him all around. But they started coaching some girls' sports teams after we got the programs going. And they came out and talked to me, and they said, Judy, we don't know how to deal with these girls. I said, you know what? What you have to remember is you're dealing with athletes. It's no different. Those girls want to play. They want to put in the time. They want to put in the effort. They want to be good. And that's what you've got. You've got athletes, and you need to forget about the rest of it. And those two guys did. And, and they came along, and, you know, they helped a whole bunch of other male coaches understand that. And, and so we developed some really positive relationships along the way. But Title IX was not an easy adjustment. I know I had female coaches who would come up to me, one of them sitting in the audience right now, and she's, she was a basic high school uh, coach and teacher, Maddie Smith. And, and a lot of them would come up to me at different times and say, you know, Judy, I'm afraid to ask for this. I don't know. I'm going to lose my job. I said, no, no, you're not going to lose your job anymore. You, you might have lost your job, you know, two years ago, but you're not going to lose it anymore. But that was a very difficult thing. And you know, you don't, you don't just jump in and stuff something down somebody's throat. 
you know, you work with people and you build relationships with people. And that's the important thing. But the end result of that is that in 1969, there were no women participating in high school athletics in Clark County. Today, there are 11 sports that females participate in Clark County. And this count I just got the other day. In the Clark County School District alone, 9,909 females participated in high school athletics this year. <laughs> 18,500 in the state. If you take those numbers times the Clark County School District 46 years ago, and multiply those numbers, even if you have those numbers, and multiplied it by 46. Look at the benefit that's happened in this state. And I'll tell you again, basic high school had the start of everything. It started here, it continued here, and it went on and on. And we have some outstanding young ladies. I just mentioned a few names, and then I'm going to pass this mic on or answer questions now or later. But some I want to mention. Uh, Barbara Gillespie taught at Basic High School. Uh, Barb was a, a, a player of mine and a player of Maddie's uh, while we were coaching here. And she also, I think they drug her out of retirement and brought her back as the athletic director. I'm not sure on the time frame on that. but. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's certainly somebody I want to mention. Linda James was a track star at Basic High School. Um, she won state championship in the 100-yard dash, the 220, and the relay race, if I'm right. Maddie, is that right? Yeah. First state track meet. And she also had a scholarship to a college at that time, which was unheard of. Uh, unfortunately, she was not able to go ahead and do that. But... Certainly somebody to remember. Uh, Pam Sloan, uh, a graduate of Basic High School, is now the Director of Instructional Support and Student Activities for the Clark County School District. Uh, numerous young women who've gone through this program out here are teachers in the Clark County School District. And one, I just want to, I have to say something about Renee Brown, if you've never heard of Renee Brown. A uh, long time ago, there were two uh, projects in Henderson. One was called Carver Park, and the other was called Victory Village. Uh, those weren't the best places to grow up. And Renee Brown grew up in the projects in Henderson. Uh, she was playing in the fifth grade at the rec center uh, here in Henderson that Dundee Jones supervised and ran. And I came out to see her because I was, I was going to uh, hopefully eventually someday be at Basic High School. And I remember talking to a junior high school teacher in, in Henderson by the name of Maxie Gulliford. And she said, Judy, there are a lot of talented girls here in this fifth grade league that, that the direct department ran. But there's one that's impossible. She is totally uncontrollable, and I don't know how they've left her play all this time. Her name was Renee Brown. When I went to basic high school, Renee was a freshman. And I remembered seeing her in the fifth grade. She did not play in the junior high school very much because uh, Ms. Gulliford said, I can't, I can't do it. She was there some, but she didn't play much. In all the years that I've been involved in education, I have never been challenged to the extent that I was with Renee Brown. Uh, it was like, oh my goodness, which one of us is going to last this school year? Uh, I, I don't know that that's possible. Uh, and at the end of the year, I remember saying at the banquet those very words, and I was saying, you know, we're both still here, and I'm not sure how. 
because it, it, was, it was something else. Uh, I, I, I didn't have the ability, or the, I, I didn't have the patience that probably Renee needed. He showed up. I knew he would. <laughs> but, but Maddie Smith uh, took over after I left basic and went to the student activities. And Renee Brown went on and played a ball for Maddie through high school. And, and then Renee went to UNLV and played basketball and graduated with a master's in education administration from UNLV. Projects in Henderson, master's in administration at UNLV. She taught for a little while at Cannon Junior High School, coached a little bit at Clark High School, at uh, Chaparral High School, and then I stole her from Chaparral High School to be my varsity basketball coach at Bonanza. And uh, we, had a, we had a great year, and she came to me at the end of the school year and said, you know, Miss Cameron, it was always Miss Cameron, Miss Cameron, Ms. still is Miss Cameron, uh, I, I have a chance to go do an assistant coaching position at San Jose State. I hate, I hate to leave this job. I said, you got to be kidding me, you know. You get yourself out of here and you go to San Jose State, which she did. And then she went to Stanford and, as an assistant coach. And then she went to the University of Kansas as an assistant coach. And then she was asked to select some of the team players for the Olympics, for the Atlanta Olympics in 2000. And then again as an assistant coach for them. And then also in 2004, uh, she went to the next Olympics, where I, it slips my mind. But again, she was asked to travel with the, with the US team and to be involved with them. At the end of that time, uh, something was in the mix called the WNBA, Women's Basketball, National Basketball Association. And Renee was asked to be in charge of player personnel for the WNBA for the, in the first year that it started. Uh, she just retired after about 20 years, I think about 20 years with the WNBA, was a vice president uh, of the WNBA, second in charge, uh, had an office on Fifth Avenue, and, you know, she to this day remembers where she came from, uh, the projects in Henderson. And as she often said, who as a ninth grade girl coming out of the projects in Henderson could have believed that I have the life I have today? And she's been very wonderful in saying to Maddie and I, you know, come to the first WNBA game, uh, Here's some tickets for the U.S. Tennis Open, uh, things like that. And so it just goes to show you that athletics for women has done so much. And basic high school started a lot of that. And you can be very proud of those young women who've graduated from basic and gone on to have careers like Renee did. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Judy, I did want to say I'm sorry I talked so much, you know, because I knew I was talking over you, so. <laughs> I love, you know, I'm asked to do this, this MC gig all the time, and I love it because I don't have to ask many questions. These folks have their own stories. Now, Norm is here, and I think we're going to move to him next, um, because he came in late, we're going to catch him next. Um, most of you probably know Norm. Uh, he grew up in Henderson, attended basic high school from 52 to 55. Um, knew Lyle Burkholder, Gordon McCaw, Robert Taylor, John Dooley, Michael Callahan. You know, and this was not that big a place at that point. Uh, lettered in football, baseball, and basketball all four years. I'm, I'm, it's in my, my notes here. Then went on to Indiana University and um, Ended up coming back here and began coaching at Rancho. Worked uh, planning and supervising sports and extracurricular activities. And um, so I'm going to let him start. What I'm, what I'm hoping that you'll do is 
talk a little bit about the original high school because I understand you started high school in the original one downtown. Yes, and, and how things changed as you moved to what was then the new high school and um, how sports changed and, and uh, grew at that point. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Laporta, good to see you. Uh, how many of you were here in 1944? Except Mr. Laporta. Well, that's, when I, that's when I came. How many? Who is that? Oh, no. <laughs> Betty? And Donna? And John? Well, they won't tell on me if I get a little off stray and tell a little lies here now. But, uh, you know, as people get older, we say we get better. What we did. Right, Coach? <laughs> Anyhow. My family moved here in 1944, lived in Victor Village until 1951 when we got a, a house in Townsite. Uh, I had never played athletics until I came to Henderson, but I, as I came, I was only eight years old. There was nothing here, desert. In Victor Village, we had a spot down by the bachelor's quarters that we could uh, play uh, a uh, little baseball. Uh, other than that, that was about what we had. But when I got into high school, the only grass we had was the football field. I think there was more grass on that football field, all the homes in the old town site combined. And, and that was basically it. Uh, we hung around uh, Pisker's Pool Hall for a while. Uh, but athletically, uh, baseball, it's, it's not far from here. One of the first places was down by the, uh, which would be now Baden Wagon and Water Street, where the old nursery used to be, across from the water reservoir. It had a grade of probably that much, about 3% going downhill. So <laughs> you would appreciate that. Uh, then we moved to the old Legion Field for another year, which was down at uh, Lake Mead and Boulder Highway behind the Albertsons down there. Then my senior year in baseball, we came back and we played most of the places in Las Vegas. When we went to Las Vegas, we played at the old Cashman Field. We went to Boulder City, we played on fields. The only other dirt field I ever remember playing on was down in Needles. And uh, that senior year, we came back from the state tournament, and I was working at the theater, and, and uh, John Tartan, our baseball coach, called us and said, report to the football field. We got some work to do. Well, what time do you want me there, coach? I got work today at 1 o'clock. He said, you report at 7, we'll make sure Van Wagen and understands and if you're a little late. So I go to down there, and here's all the baseball team down there. We have tractors, graders, rollers, lumber, chicken wire, big steel posts. Coach, we're going to build us a baseball field. And we did that Saturday, that weekend. That baseball field that's at the old Burkholder field, they leveled that off that whole weekend and made it a baseball field. Chicken wire backstock, two by four backstops. But we had us an on-campus baseball field. And that's where we played my senior year. I have been to that park now. That is a beautiful park. But in those days, if you raked it, all you did was rake more rocks up. So everybody, Tartan's rule was, you're standing out there, if you're not doing anything, throw rocks away. Or you pick one up and there's another one that comes up. And just, that's all you do all day, all day. That's where we got into the state CIF. We won the first Nevada State Baseball Championship up in Fallon. 
Uh, we didn't know until almost the end of the season that Nevada was going to hold a championship. It had been the first. They'd never done it before. Tartan calls us about mid-season and says, it looks like if we win the conference, they're going to hold a, a state baseball championship. So we won the conference and went and played up there, played foul and beat Chubb Dracula, it should seem, two and one. Then we go to basketball. When I played basketball for three years at the old town, how many remember the old town site gym? You know, I could lay down, touch the center circle, and the circle the free throw line. The end line was right here. You had to give them three feet so we could get the ball in the end court. At, at, the, at the Water Street end. At the other end was a, a theater. And they had a little theater stage and they had to uh, put blankets and things on there because running in for a layup, that's pretty hard if there wasn't something there to stop you. It, uh, Another thing in it, Jim, <laughs> if you shot a, th a shot straight into the th basket from the, from the top of the free throw lane, you'd hit a rafter. <laughs> you had to walk over here, make sure you're, you were shooting this way. <laughs> so, the, so you get between the rafters. There were two seats, two rolls of seats, before the court, and their feet were right on the in, on the sideline. <laughs> I remember once when my brother was playing. He had spent some summers up in Caliani with with those working the Andy dancers. So when Lincoln County came down here, they called him all courts, sorts of things. <laughs> my mother sitting behind the Lincoln County bench. God bless her soul, if any of you knew Maud, <laughs> you'd understand this. She only took so much, and she picks up her purse and starts hitting this player in front of him <laughs> and tells him to quit calling her son those nasty names. <laughs> but that was quite a gym. You go on, go on the Water Street side, if the doors happened to be open, you'd go for a layup, you were on Water Street. You just, there was nothing to stop you. You just went straight on down. Uh, <laughs> when we moved to the new gym in my senior year, after we left the old town site high school, we moved in uh, January of 54 to the new site and started in the school. There, although the gym was not ready, we still played that year, my junior year, down the old town, town site school. Uh, when, the, when, the, when the new gym was, was opened, Bob Lund had the keys, and nobody went in that gym except the custodial staff and the coaches. The first practice, nobody did anything. No balls were allowed. Bob got us together, and he gave us a pep talk about the season, as coaches do. And then he asked the manager for a ball. And he got the ball, and he stood at the free throw line and sunk a free throw. And he says, now, none of you can claim you made the first basket in this new gym, <laughs> because I did. <laughs> the uh, football was, like I say, the only grass in town. And that, at that time, was really not that good. Uh, when I was working, I, I made sure that, that the kids at Clark County got to play on the best facilities that we could afford at the time. Excuse me. I've never talked this long in my life. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
but in football, we did we did have a, a successful team my senior year. Uh, before that, uh, we'd go five and four, three and six. Could never beat Las Vegas, and I never beat Las Vegas, although we came close my senior year. Uh, but athletics in in Henderson, every kid that there were some kids that played football that should not have been out there. But my freshman year, we didn't have enough to scrimmage when this is McDonough was our coach. Uh, my brother graduated in 1951. His graduating class was 36. My freshman class going in in 1951 was 210. So from there, Henderson really took off as far as population. That's why we got the new school and went on from there. Uh, when I left Henderson and went to Indiana, my intention was strictly to come back here and coach and teach. Uh, when I graduated, uh, Henderson had just hired a, a football coach. So I went and coached at Rancho with John Rasmick, or excuse me, John Rasmick was my room, roommate at Indiana. Chuck Rasmick was my high school football coach. He had a position open at Rancho, and I went in there and, and started with him. I left coaching in 1967 and went with Bob Blunt to uh, the administration and started from there. Let me regress a little bit and go back to sports in Henderson. A uh, few of you might remember Hugh Moran. Hugh Moran was a deputy sheriff stationed at the old station down where the Rainbow Club is now. Every summer after school was out, Hugh Moran would drop a bag of baseball equipment off on his way to work at the old titanium softball field. We would gather all day and we would play baseball all day. Until Hugh Moran got off work, come by, pick up the equipment, take off. Next morning, that equipment was there. Whether we played, whether we showed up or not. After work, Hugh came and got it. And that's what we did all summer. And that's why I think is the only sport at that, at that time that we could beat Las Vegas in. That's one thing they did not dominate. We probably, matter of fact, my senior year, they had a tournament, Las Vegas Invitational. Needles and Blythe and Boulder City and Kingman and, and a couple of California schools in Las Vegas and Basic. We won it, never got the trophy. And I talked to those Vegas guys, and they say, we don't know what happened to it. Well, I've been told it's in Las Vegas trophy case with their name on it. They had already put their name on, thought they were going to win it. Uh, the, the good old days of what old timers could do. But and again, going back to when I got into administration, and I told Bob Blunt, I, was, I loved coaching and I loved working with kids. I was president of the Coaches Association. And I had done some work for Bob and he liked it. And he said, how would you like to come to work for me? And he says, Bob, I said, I love coaching. You know, I'm president of the Coaches Association. We want to do some things. And he said, if you come to work for me, you can do more for more kids in my office than you can coaching Rancho your entire career. And I think we accomplished that. Between three of us, Bob Blunt, Judy, and myself. In, in 1972, no, actually it was uh, uh, February 71, Bob Blunt comes back from a conference and says, Norm, Title IX is coming down the pipe. And he explained to me what Title IX is. It basically... And I heard it, Billy Jean King says, it's 37 words. But it says, there will be equal opportunity in education. That's basically what those 37 words said. 
But what ramification those 37 words had, not only us in Clark County, the girls were playing GAA if the school even had that. What it meant was girls had to have the same opportunity to participate in athletics that boys had. Boys had 10 teams. What in the heavens were we going to do? So Bob comes back from this conference and says, Norm, we've got to do something. Let's do it now. I said, Bob, it's March. We can't. What do you want to do this spring? He said, well, what do the girls do in the spring? I said, play softball. We'll have a softball tournament. So we had this tournament. And <laughs> things didn't go quite like they should have as far as administration and rules and, and that type of thing because we're just thrown together real quick. I had female coaches. I don't know whether she's here tonight or not. I don't see her. She just laid into me <laughs> something terrible. And I had never been spoken to like that by anybody, male or female. And I just didn't, didn't know what to do. So I went back to the office and told Bob Blunt, I said, you get a female in this office, because I'm not going through that again. <laughs> That's when this young lady came aboard. And boy, what a job she did. She was coaching at basic at the time, and, and Bob had known her, I believe, because when he brought up the name, I'd never heard of her. But I will go back again to that tournament, and she spoke of Renee Brown. During the tournament, this little skinny, little African-American from basic high school used language and gestures I had never heard of or seen. <laughs> <laughs> and, as, and as I talked to Judy, I said, Judy, if we're going to get this thing off the ground, we can't have that. No way can we have our athletes acting in that manner. She had talked to Renee, and Renee was a freshman. And I don't think as much as I was around Renee as she went through high school and have talked to her since and been to meetings with her that I've ever heard any, anything close to the language she used that day. And Judy's told you the rest. You want to know what athletics does for people, for kids? That's what it does. It gives them something to look forward to. And I'm sh sure Judy told Renee, if that behavior continues, we can't have you on this team. Knowing Judy, I'm sure that, that something like that was said to Renee. Because I've been around Judy long enough to know, after we started working together, that that's the kind of lady she is. Anyhow, that, that's pretty much, you know, early basic. Uh, I had some pictures here. I'll, sh I'll just show them to coach if, if uh, what did, you, did you say? Here. Here. Yeah. I know that uh, Coach plays at Empson Field. Did you play for Coach Empson? Hmm? Sure. Or you play for Cherish, Gary? Uh, Dick Empson was, <laughs> was a big old Arkansas boy. He was coaching baseball at, at uh, the time. And what a character he was. Going out, walking out the mound, relieving the pitchers, had both hands in the back of his pocket. Big old long strides. Whoop. Oh, heavens. <laughs> this is, uh, let me see. That's Henderson Elementary basketball team, 1950. That's, that's the guy right there. There's one of them. Jimmy Miller, Rodney Blue, Gil, uh, uh, Paul Southers, 
Ray Crunk, Ronald White, Ray Martinez. That's, uh, oh, one of my mentors, this guy, Bob Lund, or uh, <laughs> Bob Taylor. He asked me why I didn't go out for basketball. I said, Coach, I don't have a pair of shoes. The next day, I had a pair of shoes. Why don't you go to the next one, Rick, if you... Look familiar? This is a 1948, no, 1949, Henderson Elementary basketball team. Pretty much the same guys. Rodney Blue, Dennis Sharon, Gary Van Horn, Jimmy English. <laughs> I had breakfast with this guy every Tuesday morning, Dr. Kent McBeth. Uh, Kronk and Virgil, is Virgil here tonight? Did he, Rick, did he say he was going to come? Yeah, Dick Boardbell, Hunter, and myself. Uh, why don't you go to the next one? This is my junior year in high school. Look at the same guys at the pictures you just saw. Kent McBeth, Dennis Sharon, Virgil East, Gary Van Horn, Miller, Lockridge, uh, Albertson, myself, Bordwell, and Butch Walker. And Lynn was our manager, and of course, my mentor, Bob Blunt. One of my mentors, there's, I had four of them here at school. I was very lucky. Estes McDaniel, Bob Blunt, John Tartan, Chuck Resmick, and Don Smith. They all took me, took everybody under their wing uh, and just, you know, made sure that we stayed the straight and narrow as, as much as the sheriffs would let us do in this town at that time. Now here is what I wanted Coach to see. This is where I played my freshman year, one of my, no, my junior year baseball. This is the field down behind Albertsons at Lake Mead and Boulder Highway. Coach, how'd you like to play on that? <laughs> now that, there was no fence, outfield fence. All they had in the outfield was a, was a flag. And the flag flew every time we played a ball game. That's the same field that my brother played on. And there was a center fielder at that time by the name of George Rothstein. Lou, you remember the Rothstein family? George went after fly ball, full go, and hit that goal post, or that flagpole. He, to this day, he carries that scar on his forehead. And he is a major general, retired from the US Army. Went to the academy, graduated. Last time I talked to him, he had just retired living in uh, Virginia. Show the next one, if you would. Now this is the one we built. It looks like the ground's all the same. Might have a f few less rocks in it, but you can see the, the, the boards and the backstop, no padding, it just bounced off that. Our catcher at the time, Bobby Peck, <laughs> he knew how far that ball was going to bounce when it, it, when it, if anything got by him. How far it would come back to him, how far he had to turn around to get it. But that's, hmm? yeah, that's the one up at Burkholder now, which is the last time I saw a beautiful field. 
The only problem with this field, other than being dirt, when they leveled it, it was about, the right field, it was about 310, 315, and about a drop off of about four feet at that point. And if you remember, the ditch is still there. And, and the, the, the drop off is still there. In the center field, it was about maybe 12 feet. Down the left field line, it was about three, four feet drop down. With no fence. John Tartan had a, Coach Tartan had a buddy, had played some minor league ball, and he came down and he was hitting fly balls to us while John was hitting the infield. And one thing I loved about this park, you notice I bat left handed. The wind always blows off back Black Mountain, down that mountain. Boy, it blew out to right field, just great. I loved that wind when it came off Black Mountain. Anyhow, the wind was blowing as those March and, and May and April winds do around here, coming off Black Mountain. And with no fence, this Coach Hadfield was hitting fly balls. The outer field was right there, and we were always trying to communicate with one another. And he hit one to me, and my right fielder, Rodney Blue, says, Norm, you're okay. You're okay. You're okay. Norm. <laughs> Next I know, I'm laying down. Rodney's picking my eye up, and he says, I can't see anything but white. <laughs> I landed. I landed on my glove hand right here. I had to go to work that night at the theater. I couldn't tear, tear theater tickets. It was so sore. <laughs> Never again did I listen to Rodney Blue. <laughs> well, like I say, that's a, a beautiful park now. And uh, so is yours at, at Empson, Empson Field, Coach. But that's the things we, we, the facilities we were using well, this is 1950, 1955. I think you got another, you got another picture there? That's all of them. That's all of them? Uh, going back to working with Judy and what we tried to do and, and, and uh, the office in there, and you know, one thing, I uh, was accused one time by a coach that I favored one school when Judy and I were together, that it seemed like every time this, this school called or wanted something, that they, they got it. I said, let me tell you something. I graduated from basic high school. My wife graduated from Las Vegas high school. My daughter graduated from Rancho High School. My son graduated from Valley High School. My stepson graduated from Clark High School. My son-in-law graduated from Western High School. Now, which one of those am I favoring? Because if I don't favor them all, I got a whole family to contend with. Never heard from him again. But we, we tried to do things that, that helped athletics and, and uh, in general, the, the whole county. But I think uh, what happened out here in, the, in my, my early career developed me into what I think ended up as a pretty good guy. Uh, I know a lot of coaches and administrators when I was athletic director of the district didn't believe that <laughs> because you have to make some hard decisions. Eligibility, facilities, you know, things that you really have no control if you follow the rules and regulations. And that's what we tried to do. Uh, I believe that's it for now. Sounds good. Thank you. Our third speaker for tonight is Scott Baker. 
Um, I, I'm not going to ask you any questions either. I will note that he's a graduate of Basic High School, class of 88, played on the 87 state champion basic team, uh, played professionally, and then returned to Clark County to become a high school baseball coach and is head coach at Basic Academy of International Studies. Is that the correct, That's correct. correct title? Okay. He also coaches an American Legion team, which itself won the 2017 American Legion World Series. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Scott, to bring it forward a little bit. All right. Thank you. Uh, what an honor to be sitting here with you two. It's, it's pretty special. Um, I'm not really good at talking about myself. Um, don't really like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, my parents moved here. My whole family moved here when uh, I was five years old, 1990, uh, 1975. Um, we moved to Las Vegas. Um, they were out of work at the time. We were in a van when we moved here in a, in a supermarket in Las Vegas. I don't remember the name of it. Um, we lived across the street from UNLV. Um, lived with right in the same apartment complex as the UNLV basketball players at the time. Um, 1997 is when we got our first uh, home, and it was about two miles down the road from here. Um, 1997, like they were saying, it was there was still not much here. Uh, I went to Gordon McCall. I went to Fay Galloway. Uh, I went to Burkholder um, when it was the junior high. Um, and then obviously I went to basic high school also. Um, graduated in 1988. Uh, Went to two years in college. Um, don't let me back up just a little bit. I want to kind of talk about there. There was no little league when I was in, when I was when I came up. It was it was HPRD if you guys remember. It was Henderson Parks and Recreation Department. Little league was only in Las Vegas at the time. It had not transitioned up into Henderson at that time, and that was 78, 79ish. It still had not got got up there. Um, so it was just, you know, Dundee Jones, Clyde Caldwell, um, people like that were just, you know, organizing leagues, and that was basically our little league, but we couldn't move on at that time. We just, we win the league and it would be over. Um, that's, that was, I don't know, I don't know the exact year that Little League came into Henderson. I, I want to say it was a few years after that, but um, I went to high school, played for Gary Cheris. Um, was fortunate enough to be on the state championship team in 87. Uh, went to two years of junior college, uh, Arizona Western and Taft, California. Uh, my second year, after my second year, I got drafted uh, by the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, ended up playing 12 years professionally, uh, seven different countries, um, Korea, South Korea, <laughs> South Korea. Um, uh, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Canada, Mexico, Japan. Um, I, I've been everywhere uh, professionally. Um, got married, had two kids. I've uh, been married for 24 years now. Uh, both my kids just graduated, uh, well, just both graduated from college, but they both graduated from high school in 2012 from Bishop Gorman High School. Um, I had surgery in 2002. Uh, that was my last year playing professionally. Um, I thought I was going to be able to make a comeback. Didn't work out. Um, I'd been traveling for 12 years out of a suitcase. Um, my kids were starting to get a little older. So at that point, I figured it would be better to kind of come home and, and shut, the, shut the dream down. Um, at that point, I uh, ended up coaching with a player that, it, that I'd played with in the minor leagues. He was the head coach at Bishop Gorman High School at the time. And I ended up being an assistant coach for him, Chris Sheff. And I was with him for seven years. Um, he got the college job at the College of Southern Nevada. I went with him there. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out there. And at the same time that it didn't work out there, basic high school needed a, a, had an opening for a baseball coach. Um, at the time, um, Barb Gillespie was the athletic director there. Uh, I went in and just kind of somebody had told me, "Hey, I think I think they'd like you to come in and just you know talk to them." Uh, so I went down there, 
and I said, what's the, you know, what's the protocol for, you know, coming and seeing what the, what's uh, the job? And she said, well, you, we can set up an interview for you next week. So Greg Hunter, who's now the principal at Canyon Springs, uh, Barb Gillespie, and I can't remember who the third person was, but um, I went in there uh, the next week and uh, kind of gave him my spiel. Just a really quick story, and it's kind of special now in retrospect. They asked me, they, they kind of said, you know, Scott, you're, 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 you're little, you know, you don't, you're not a teacher here. You're a little overqualified for the job. And I'm, you know, I was kind of like, you know, excuse me? You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand really. And they're like, well, you know, what's your vision? What do you want to do with the program? This is a true story. Um, it's kind of cool. At the time, these three people are sitting in front of me. And I said, I'm not here to win state titles. I'm here to win national titles. And now it's came back. And the first person to, now, now Barb Gillespie, who's now retired, obviously, she's not at basic high school anymore. She was the first person to text me. And she remembered the talk six years ago. So that was, that was very cool. Um, so now, been at basic high school for six years. Um, this is going to be my seventh year. This is one of my coaches here that's been with me since the very beginning, Essex Burton. Um, the, the transition... Yep. The, just speak a little bit about the transition of sports from when I played. I, I did play three sports in high school. I, I, I played baseball and I also played tennis and I bowled. Uh, state champion bowlers at basic high school in, in 87. Um, you know, I, I played three sports and nowadays it's so personalized and it, and it has changed dramatically from when, even from 10 years ago. There's so many personal trainers. There's so many people that are, have gotten involved in lessons. And it's, it's kind of, you know, when we talk about it to the, in our parent meetings, it's kind of got to the point where, and, and it's sad because it was awesome in high school, jumping from sport to sport to sport. It was very cool. You didn't have to worry. You know, you went, all 12 of you went from football, you know, tennis to bowling to football to wherever it went. You didn't have to worry about 15 other players staying in that one sport while you moved on while they're still getting better in that sport. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's so refined that kids are going one sport. I loved playing three sports in high school. Three, three sport, uh, you know, letter in all three sports all four years. I, didn't, I wasn't fortunate to do that, but it was just very cool back then, and, and it, was, it was very unique. And, and I think the transition nowadays is – even more unique, and it's gotten away from the three-sport athlete. I don't know how it's going to transition in the future, but I know right now it, it has gone to where, and baseball is such a skill sport, it's incredible. I mean, some of you might take offense to this, we always say it, you know, a football player can go out there and tackle somebody pretty easily. A basketball player can make a basket, will try and, try and get in the box against someone throwing 90 miles an hour. It's so it's so such a skill sport that you actually do need the repetition nowadays to be really elite. It's almost like we say it's like the Olympians. Olympians are not two sport athletes. Olympians are not six months out of the year. Olympians are like it's unreal. That's all they do is eat, drink, sleep their sport to become the best, and that's kind of what it's went to. I would say in the last ten years. Um, I don't really promote three sports. I would like our kids to be one sport, but I am the first one to, if our kids play multiple sports right now, on the baseball team, I think we have seven or eight that play uh, football, two or three that are playing tennis, and, and, and I love it. I, I go support them, and I go watch them in their, their games. Um, it's just unfortunate that it's went that route uh, nowadays. So that's my story. Good. Thank you. I haven't had any questions come up from Bob or his wife. I, I, I have a question for you, because we're talking about a, a little span of time here. And we're in southern Nevada. One of the things that we know is real here is it gets a little warm outside. <laughs> and when you are playing sports, you're playing outside a lot of times. No, not always. Sometimes you have to kind of kick in the door for the gymnasium. I got that. but. 
how has it changed how sports, how, how did you deal with heat when you were in school and how has it changed to today? Man alive. Uh, Estes McDonough was my uh, freshman, or the only coach base he had at, in 1951. No water. Twice a day. No water. Uh, and that was pretty much, when, when Charlie Rasmi came, he gave us a water break. But maybe five minutes and you're trying to get water down 45 kids in five minutes. You know how much you can drink. So I go to Indiana. <laughs> a kid that's a desert rat practiced in 110, 112 degree heat. Never thought anything of it. I go back to IU, Bloomington, in August. Practice. I'm dead. 15 minutes, I'm dead. I said, my, oh, my, how hot is it out here? And the coach says, Norm, it's only 90 degrees. The other assistant says, yeah, and it's 95 degrees humidity. <laughs> And again, no water. We had guys going permanently into sprinkler heads because that's where they would water before the field, before practice. <laughs> that's where the water, they would suck on grass. <laughs> Later on, when, when uh, that coaching staff left, uh, my, you know, my sophomore year, then we get a, a guy out of Wyoming, Phil Dickens, and he was a disciplinarian. He was a time guy, he was a schedule guy, and he was a water guy. And we had our water breaks. And that reminds me of a, a, something you said a while ago. I went to Indiana, Indiana on, to play two sports, baseball and football. The coach said, if you make the traveling team, as a sophomore, you can play baseball in the spring. And I said, okay. So I, after the second game, my sophomore year, I start. I start against Notre Dame as, my, as a sophomore. So I said, you know, I'm thinking back, my boy, I get spring ball, spring baseball. Well, after the Purdue game and we lost, I go up to the coach's office the next day and he's gone. I said, where's Coach Crimmins? They said, he was fired last night. So I'm wondering now what's going to happen. There's two of us, a kid by the name of Bob Lawrence, big tackle. So when the new coaching staff comes in and we approach him, Phil Dickens, he said, uh, well, you've got an option. You can play baseball or you can, you can stay on a football scholarship or you can go on a baseball scholarship. Well, I knew what the baseball scholarship was. They split, a, they split the money of a scholarship about five different times. My football scholarship was board, room, books, tuition, $15 a month. And <laughs> I didn't have much of a choice. So I, I stayed with football. Uh, I had been scouted as a high school kid and they said, <laughs> You go to college, we know you can play baseball, you just learn to hit the curveball. <laughs> Never did. Uh, and I forgot the second story I was going <laughs> hmm? Oh, the water thing. <laughs> Speaking of water. <laughs> when I was coaching at Rancho, we decided that you know, that was, that was not the right thing to do. Every coach at Rancho was a health educator, and we knew that <laughs> that was not the right thing to do. So we talked to our team physician, and, and he said, give the kids as much water as they want, have scheduled water breaks, but give the kids as much water as they want, but salt it down. You know, 
make it a, a salt solution so they can replenish that salt in their system. So we would give them their water breaks and, and uh, they would come back and, and we'd work up about 10 minutes and everybody was getting sick because they would soak up that salted water. <laughs> and you know, you can only take so much of that stuff and next thing you know, it's gonna come back up after a workout. So we then decided, no, nah, we'll just let them drink as much water as they want to during the water breaks. They will learn how much to drink. You got, you got a two hour practice, you know that you're gonna get three water breaks in the morning. In the evening, you only get two because we're at night, it's not as hot. When I got into administration, I made sure there are two things, that every fall when we had our meeting, we had a nurse and a doctor's representative or trainers at our general session meetings talk about contact, how much contact, what you can do, weight loss, water breaks, and the general health of all of our kids. And I, and I hope they're still doing that today because it's very important with, with, with the heat that we have that they get those types of, of rest because it, it, especially in football, and uh, it's really difficult. I will relate one thing. If you noticed the first picture down at the old field by Albertsons and the one in the white field when we were over, white jersey when we were over here, those were wool serge uniforms. Now, not many of you know if you've ever worn wool serge. And why was wool serge? That's what the pros wore. And John Darton wanted that. And if you look at that, it's pretty much designed as the old Dodgers uniform in the 50s. <laughs> So yeah, I just uh, just to let you know, at Bonanza every year we had a doctor come out, not only talk with our football team and players, but with the parents of those players, so that they had an idea of how the, how to deal with heat and what we were doing about it, what precautions we took at the school. Also, and I'm sure it's the same thing. Although I'll let Scott answer that. Uh, you know, there was a trainer at every football game. Uh, we were fortunate, Bonanza, we had a trainer at every football practice uh, when the kids were out in the heat. Uh, you also have some heat to deal with in the spring. So it's, it's not only in football season, although it's pretty intense there and, and you're dealing with a different type of competition. But those precautions were always taken. And I, I know that was done at every high school. And I'm sure, I don't know what they're doing now and everything, but I'm sure they all have trainers. Yeah, we, we have trainers. And, and nowadays there's, there's such a demand for the safety first. Um, with the heat, with, and especially this, sound, sound funny to us, but I mean, we, the baseball program right now with us, we practice more than anybody. I want to say we practice as more, much as anybody in the country. Um, so we went to the route of, if somebody wants a drink, go get a drink. I mean, it's it's that simple. Um, to to you know the, the the discipline of back in the day. I remember I had one of the best coaches you could have in Gary Cheris, and you know you, you just didn't you didn't ask to go get a drink. You just didn't. Nowadays, the way that it's uh, you know progressed over the years is it's it's everybody's on the spotlight. Everybody's looking at everything. You're not going to get away with it nowadays. If some if something happened to a kid nowadays, I you'd be I'd be devastated. I think everybody would. Um, and the first thing they'd say is, you didn't let them have a drink of water. Um, go get a drink, come right back. It's, it's pretty simple to me. Okay. Were there any other questions that came up? Otherwise, Rick, you, did, you were supposed to fill out a card, Rick. You know the rules here. Really? Okay, we're going to give him a break, right? It's all right? Okay, Rick. A basic? Uh, who were the doctors that, that uh, 
helped with the team at Basic High School. Uh, <laughs> I could tell me the doctors, but I can't remember ever seeing one on a football field <laughs> at that time. Uh, Dr. Coogan. Uh, Uh, what was his name? There was a doctor down, had his office by the community church. And the first time I went to see him, my mother was with me, and she said, boy, that guy looks familiar. What was his name? Anyhow, just a little story. When they, when they got to talking, he was a doctor at an Indian reservation that my father worked with up in northern New Mexico. And they meet in Henderson, and I can't remember his name. Dr. Any, Meyer. Dr. Meyer. Dr. Meyer, right. Uh, we would go to them for injuries. I remember Dr. Coogan giving physicals down at Rose de Lima. I do remember that. We had all lined up and go in and see Dr. in the cough and the, in the uh, check your arms and your joints and make sure everything's working. But that was about it. Now, they are required, I think, coach, isn't it? Uh, every two years, they're supposed to have a physical. A com every other, well, yeah, every other year, they're supposed to have a complete physical. Not just seeing if, if you can move your elbow or move your shoulders. But uh, that was not a big, big thing back then. I remember my brother got hurt his senior year, and it was basically when he got home, it was up to the family. Uh, there was no, you know, I'm sure it was either Dr. Miner or Dr. Uh, Coogan that, that treated him because I think Dr. Starzinski and Dr. Compton, although they lived out here, worked in Vegas, had their practice in Las Vegas. Uh, so that's pretty much what it was here. Uh, it did improve at Rancho. Uh, when we when I came back to Rancho in '60, uh, uh, Dr. West was the team physician had been for since the school opened. And when I was head named head coach at Rancho, uh, Dr. West said he was retiring and that uh, he wouldn't be available. And at that time. Uh, Kit Macbeth had left the service and moved back and started his practice in Las Vegas. So I got hold of Kent and asked him if he would uh, had time since he was starting his practice to be our team physician, and he agreed to do that. And he did a great job. And I my my thing with the parents and 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 the kids, if a kid is hurt and he's referred to the doctor on the field. That doctor has everything to say about him playing again that night. If the doctor says he can't play, he doesn't play. I've even had parents come down out of the stands, come up to the sidelines during a ball game, and wondering why their kid's not playing. And, I, and I've told them in the parents' meetings, until that doctor releases him, he's not going to play. Off subject just a little bit, but one thing I want to mention, as a result of Title IX, I, I think you need to understand what really happened. We, we had high school programs for young women. We had college programs for young women. We had scholarships for young ladies who had never been able to have a scholarship because there was no program to play at at a college. Salaries for coaches, for women coaches, uh, became available. Uh, that had not happened prior to that time. Uh, women became uh, officials in many, many, many sports. Today, you will see many of those officials in some of the men's pro teams. Uh, there's a couple of ladies now that are NFL officials. Uh, physical therapists started working with athletic teams, uh, women physical therapists and trainers, uh, sports doctors, Women became sports doctors. That had not happened prior to the time. Uh, sports announcers. You see many women on TV now as sports announcers. That was never the case. Athletic administrators. Uh, just to give you an idea, in 1972 when Title IX went into effect, 
Uh, I, I happen to be lucky enough to be the first woman athletic administrator in Clark County in 1985. It took that long once that law went into effect. Uh, athletic directors, corporate women, became, became uh, many women became corporate in sports organizations. That was never available. Another statistic that I thought was really interesting, and this doesn't have anything to do with athletics, but Title IX affected many, many things other than athletics. That was only part of it, but it was the, it was the part that came out in the papers, that's for sure, that the public took. But in 1970, 12% of women were admitted into law school. In 1970, 1970 to 1972, 12%. Today, 50-some percent of women in law school, 50-some percent are women in law school. Uh, several of our Supreme Court justices graduated from Harvard and Yale with a degree in law. They couldn't get a job as a lawyer prior to 1972 when this came into effect. So Title IX affected so many more things other than just athletics. And, and I think it's important to remember that. We certainly don't want it to ever go away. Did you want to say anything about the uh, doctors on the field, sir? We've got one more question for you after this. Yeah. Uh, like, like I said, we, we have trainers that are there. Um, the, the protocol is, is if, if somebody does get hurt, uh, like Norm said, it's, it's mandatory. They can't get back on the field until the doctors released them. Um, that's through our training, trainer that's at the high school. Um, as soon as I get the note um, that they are released, he can go back to, to practicing on whatever is, is dying. All righty. Then we've got one more question, and, uh, and I'm going to do this by person because we can talk about the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it's a good question. Did students have academic requirements to keep their grades up in order to play in the 50s? Absolutely. It's basically, I don't, I've been retired almost a long time. <laughs> but just, I mean, in, yeah. Uh, yes, when, when I was basic, it was a C or above. Okay, same, you know, same thing with 60s and that, 70s? Uh, when I left, excuse me, when I left, yep. oh, I'm sorry, went beyond my years, go ahead. That's all right. Yes, we did. Uh, all, there were always, they were always there. Okay. You know, they were always there. Uh, even before, you know, I know all the women that were involved in programs before the district had a program, we all individually had our own requirements. Ah, okay. You know? And the 80s, I think, the same way? Uh, yeah, it was a, a 2.0 um, when I was in high school. Uh, I would just go into right now with what our, our demands are as our, our coaching staff goes. We have study halls twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays that are mandatory for each, each kid. Every freshman that comes in, uh, we have a weekly grade check, and anybody that's scuffling a little bit at all, um, they're on a weekly grade check also. But it's a, it's a 2.0 right now to be eligible by CCSD and IA. Great. Yep. This became a, a problem when we started having home schools. Uh, Mid-70s, I guess, early 80s when, when homeschooling started. And not only then, it was basically an elementary, but we started to have high school kids that were being homeschooled, and their parents wanted them to participate in their zoned high school's activities. You can see the problem created when, when you talk about eligibility. Uh, although, as I understand it, they have uh, qualifying tests that they have to take every semester to prove that they're, they are being homeschooled and that they are learning, and, and just like you would take a semester test in a comprehensive high school. So that was settled that we would get these reports from parents that you know they were maintaining the grades and they had passed the, the the quarterly or, or semester exam given by the state or county, whoever controlled that. Uh, 
The other problem, it wasn't a problem, but it was a position that, that came up when we started having uh, handicapped kids come in, coming in out of uh, special classes that other than the grade-wise were eligible for athletics. Physically, there was nothing wrong with it. And that became a point of view then because you've got a, a report that is filled out by the teacher and then you've got a supervising report that is filled out. And then there was somebody in the central office that had to verify that that, that was his ch child's status. Then it was our office determination whether they could play. And well, once, once it gets to our office from all those hands, there's no the way that, that uh, I felt that we could deny the child from, from participating in whatever sport they want to participate in. Yeah, I had one more thing I just re remembered. Uh, right now, uh, you could have, there's, there's eight classes uh, at, at basic. You could actually have six, six A's and two F's, and you'd be above a 2.0. With the two F's, you're ineligible. You can't be failing two classes at the same time and be eligible for high school sports. Good. Good to know. Well, I'd like to thank our panel tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm not forgetting. I, I know what I'm doing up here. Jeez. But I do want to thank our panel tonight. I think this has been fascinating. We've learned a lot about the history of sports here. Thank you very much for coming and sharing with us tonight.